we also have the most dire gentrification and displacement issues. And I think that that um, really speaks to the need to not have transportation and housing conversations be these separate things. You know, we, we work so often in these uh, policy silos and we don't, I mean, I think that there's an ex a lot of exceptions of the folks on the panel here, but people will talk about transit-oriented development without talking about anti-displacement policy or making it harder to evict residents. Those have to be part of the same conversations because otherwise it just creates the question of who are you building transit for? Okay, well, welcome everyone to another in our series of Todd Talks here at the WGBH Forum. I'm Bob C. and I cover transportation for WGBH News. And uh, this morning, our topic will be forecasting the effects of transit cuts on equitable development around uh, transit oriented development around our gateway cities. But before we begin, as we've done on each of these programs, we take a moment of silence to remember the people who have died from COVID-19, now over 400,000 across the nation. Well, thank you and welcome uh, once again to another in these series of programs where we look at transit-oriented development in our gateway cities. And uh, participating is Tracy Corley, who is Mass Inc's Transit Oriented Development Fellow who has organized this entire series. Stephen Higashide is the Director of Research at Transit Center, an organization that works to improve transit in order to make cities more just and environmentally sustainable. He's also the author of the book, Better Buses, Better Cities. Also joining us this morning, Representative Andy Vargas. He was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in November of 2017. He previously served on the Haverhill City Council. Representative Vargas is currently a member of the Black and Latino Caucus and sits on the Ways and Means, Education, Public Health, and Small Business Committees. And William Dickerson II, the Executive Director of the Brockton Interfaith Community, a multi-faith, multi-ethnic, non-profit organization representing Greater Brockton. Their mission is to work collaboratively on issues chosen together to promote racial and economic justice through prophetic faith-rooted community organizing. Welcome to all of our guests this morning and welcome to all of you online to take part in this forum. We begin as usual with a, an audience poll. And if we can bring that up, it's uh, asking you which of the following public and private transportation services have you used since the start of the pandemic? Now you can select all that apply. Well, let's begin as uh, we have heard Certainly, the pandemic has affected everything as a, uh, and, and every way of life here in the United States, particularly transportation. And we've heard that it's really revealed a lot of uh, inequitable uh, situations regarding public transit, both in uh, the city of Boston and in our gateway cities. And uh, we also know that the MBTA is proposing a series of service reductions and service cuts in some cases in order to cope with the tremendous loss in revenue they've had as people have not been riding the T. So I'd like to begin by asking our guests and perhaps we can begin with you, Representative Fargus. Uh, what are the inequities that have been revealed in your community and how will the transit cuts exacerbate the situation? Thank you, Bob. And it's great to be here with you all. I think um, first and foremost, it's, it's good to point out that there were, these inequities have always been there uh, and, and through this pandemic, uh, they're just further exacerbating those inequities. Uh, before this pandemic, we were dealing with a commuter rail that was $24 round trip from Haverhill to Boston, uh, a commuter rail that wasn't reliable enough for people to have confidence uh, in, in taking it, uh, and a commuter rail that cost a significant portion of the income of the people that live in the transit-oriented uh, development and housing near that project before this pandemic. So we were dealing with that inequity before and, and these service uh, cuts are just further exacerbating that and making it much more difficult for people to get to their jobs, medical appointments. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the uh, early parts of this pandemic, uh, 
I uh, was in Market Basket and I was pulled aside by a veteran who wanted to advocate for another veteran that couldn't get to her medical appointment from uh, Haverhill to Jamaica Plain uh, because she, uh, the VA bus was cutting back their service because they couldn't have the same level of capacity inside those buses uh, in order to protect folks from the pandemic uh, and from the virus. Uh, but she didn't have the confidence to take the commuter rail line into North Station, pay for that, and then uh, get on the subway to get to Jamaica Plain. Um, and we had to figure out taxi service to get her from Haverhill to her appointment in Jamaica Plain. And so there are uh, tremendous issues that are just being further exacerbated by this pandemic. Uh, and we're going to have to put our heads together to make sure that we build a rail system that we can all be proud of. Thank you, uh, Representative Argus. And I wanted to mention I chose my background photo this morning because this is what commuter rail service is going to look like in Haverhill on weekends beginning tomorrow. You see tracks, but no trains. So we'll get into that a little later. Uh, let's turn next to Will Dickerson in Brockton. Will, uh, what about the situation in Brockton in terms of transit inequities that have existed and how they're going to be made worse by any cuts in transit? Yeah, um, thank you, Bob. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to really uh, agree with uh, Representative Argus uh, in, in the sense that um, so much of uh, what we're going to be looking at is uh, just unaffordability. It's been unaffordable um, in general for, for folks to, to take uh, to, to take transit, especially the commuter rail, particularly coming into to, um, to Boston from Brockton. Um, so many of our folks, um, you know, are using the commuter rail to, to get into to the city itself. And that that is one of their only means of being able to get into the city. Um, it's extremely expensive to try to take like Uber or um, or Lyft to go uh, to get into to, to Boston or to, to 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 maneuver or get around. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm really um, concerned about what is going to happen economically to to our people and their ability to be able to get to their jobs. Um, and an, an, another big part of this is that we have a, a large number of frontline workers as well um, that are inside of our city. Um, and, you know, those, those folks are going to be deeply impacted by this um, and, um, um, and, and in ways that we, in some ways, can't even uh, predict. Uh, and so Brockton is one of those particular cities that gets impacted um, by these kinds of decisions all the time. Um, and, and it's it is, you know, 90% of the time it is negatively um, impacting them. And so uh, we're just tired of getting uh, getting beat down, uh, <laughs> to tell you the truth. We're ready for people to start thinking about us and like trying to uh, figure out what it looks like to start raising up these cities um, that, are, that are surrounding mm -hmm. um, Boston. And Stephen, uh, give us the national perspective. I assume what's happening in places like Haverhill and Brockton is happening across the country. Well, you know, I often reflect with a little bit of bitterness, to be honest, around some of the discourse around essential workers. You know, early in the pandemic, we sort of created this term, essential workers. We talked about how important it was to honor essential workers. And transit is essential because it carries so many essential workers. Even before the pandemic in the Boston area, about 40% of transit commuters were essential workers. Uh, even in this moment where perhaps fewer people are riding transit, transit is helping keep the food system running. It's helping keep the healthcare system running. But are we really honoring those workers and giving them the system that they need? You know, what we've been asking people to do both in this region and across the country is weather disruption after disruption and commutes that were already difficult for the pandemic for many, you know, have become even harder as service gets less reliable. Um, one thing that I think actually is a little bit different in some other, it is not the case universally that every region is cutting service, um, particularly as new uh, tranches of federal aid are coming in. You know, the MBTA made the decision to really use a lot of that money to shore up the capital program and only restore some service cuts. Other agencies, you know, like Chicago, for example, are choosing to really maintain a lot of that service. So there are choices. Um, they're not always, you know, simple choices. I think we're providing just enough funding for transit systems to scrape by, but agencies are making different choices. Okay, thank you. We, we have the results of our first poll.
Let's see, we asked the, you what services you've been using since the start of the pandemic. And it looks pretty evenly divided. We had 30% using bus, 19% commuter rail, 38% subway. We don't have any paratransit users with us this morning. In terms of Uber and Lyft, we had 19%, no taxis, 72% using a personal car or a borrowed or rented car, and 11% none of the above. This would be a good time to bring in Tracy Corley, who has some uh, interesting information from a new poll done by the Mass Inc. polling group about how people have been traveling uh, during the pandemic and some of the obstacles to getting them back on mass transit. Tracy. Thank you, Bob. Well, I know that you know here in the MBTA, um, the MBTA here in the greater Boston area has been pointing to low ridership as the impetus for its decision to make these cuts. Uh, before we launch uh, further into the conversation, I wanted to share uh, some of that data from the Massey Polling Group's poll, which included uh, 1,262 residents of Massachusetts Gateway cities. As this slide shows, uh, they are um, uh, cities across the state, uh, highlighted in uh, light blue, uh, that um, were former industrial cities, uh, centers, but are now regional hubs. And so I also have highlighted Haverhill and Brockton so you can get, get oriented as to kind of where they are in relationship to Boston. Note that the gateway cities do not include Boston, although some gateway cities like Chelsea, Lowell, Quincy, Haverhill and Brockton have access to MBTA commuter rail, bus and sometimes subway sub service. And so between October 22nd and December 17th, uh, the Mass Inc. polling group asked about uh, travel choices amongst uh, gateway city residents. We learned that when it comes to riding transit, and we have a slide for that, it's mostly younger people who are less likely to own a car or have a full-time job with lower levels of income uh, and as well as education. This aligns with our findings that gateway city workers are more likely to be in lower paying jobs that cannot be done from home. As a matter of fact, uh, roughly 80% um, uh, of the folks who live in our gateway cities have to travel to get to work if they're actually going into work. Or, you know, we also have people who have to go to school and also get to their healthcare appointments and other things. So uh, we know that ridership is down for transit across the country. And so what's the top barrier? On the next slide, we see that of course it's uh, COVID. Uh, as this slide shows, 61% of respondents who wish to ride transit more reported that COVID was their biggest barrier. We found similar results when asked about ride hailing apps like Lyft and Uber with 59% of respondents citing COVID as the major barrier there. On transit, crowding and safety were cited as significant concerns with nearly a quarter of respondents highlighting this as the reason. Reliability, access, frequency, routes, and costs also made the top of the list. Now, although mounting evidence shows that transit vehicles themselves are safe, respondents still aren't comfortable riding transit. On the next slide, uh, we have a graphic showing that 59% of those uh, reported uh, riding transit during the pandemic uh, reported not being, uh, being not very, or sorry, not very or not at all comfortable riding transit. When asked about the risks, 44% uh, of riders uh, uh, reported ma maskless riders, um, and I think it's on the next slide. 21% um, reported maskless staff and 40% reported crowding. Roughly a third highlighted service and cleanliness. Riders seem, are seeing some of the risk factors, many of which point less to the technology or the air exchanges in, in, uh, on transit and more to issues with behaviors of others and also issues that could be resolved with improved frequency and service. So it was no surprise that frequent riders on the next slide reported more factors uh, of risk uh, more often, which we have a slide to show the differences between the frequent riders, uh, which is on the left bar, and those who rode transit less often on the right. Um, frequent riders were much more comfortable than infrequent riders on transit. On the next slide, we also see um, uh, stark differences between um, uh, frequent riders um, who, um, said, who report, 59% of whom uh, report that they're feeling uh, very or somewhat comfortable on transit in contrast to just 21% of infrequent riders. These findings indicate that by addressing the risk factors with better mask enforcement, increasing frequency to reduce crowding, um, and targeted investment for cleaning and maintenance to prevent disruptions, it might be possible to get more, more people on transit and improve that ridership number even before we have the pandemic under control. <clears throat> 
And so before I close, I wanna point out on the next slide that majorities uh, in the Gateway City support more investment in transit. And if I recall correctly, uh, this also aligns with statewide uh, support uh, for investment in transit. On this slide, we see that 81% of those surveyed support low income fares and 58% support making transit free for all riders. MassInc has been advocating for lower commuter rail fares, particularly to our gateway cities. And as you heard um, Rep Vargas mention, and I think you know, also will mention this as well, you know, just the cost of getting on transit is a major barrier and a major challenge, especially on a commuter rail. Um, as you can see, um, on this next slide, if you uh, um, uh, go to the next one, uh, cost burdens of um, <clears throat> are, 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 are an issue across the gateway cities for households. And this is a driver of low ridership. Uh, this slide at the blue bars, when added together, this shows uh, the combined housing and transportation costs. And it's recommended that they do not exceed that red line, which is 45%. And as you can see from the green section, as soon as you add commuter rail uh, fares to that, what was you know, just untenable, just trying to just make rent and transportation uh, costs and get those uh, met with household incomes. You see that once you add commuter rail fares, it just, it just doesn't pencil out for a lot of households in a lot of gateway cities. And on the next slide, you see that that is just exacerbated if you happen to live in the area around the train station. So we know that we have a lot of work to do in order to make transit services more accessible for those who need it most in our gateway cities. So getting, there, uh, go ahead. On, yeah, so getting people onto transit and comfortable using transit should be the focus of transportation policies right now. With more than 80% of our country's inhabitants living in cities large, medium, and small, there just isn't enough room for everyone to have a personal vehicle. And so Bob, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, very, uh, very good information there, Tracy, and hot off the presses, we might say. Uh, that would be a good time to bring in our second poll question, which asks how comfortable have you felt riding transit uh, since the start of the pandemic? You see the options there, would you please uh, respond and we'll let you know the results in just a minute or so. So uh, we've seen the, the challenges facing uh, getting people back to using mass transit. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Representative Vargas, maybe we can begin with you. Uh, there's a big concern about COVID-19. Is the T doing enough to cope with this problem? Well, I think the question is what exactly about COVID-19, right? Because the face masks certainly is, is something that uh, is evident is a, is a major concern for folks. Uh, so maybe we need some more enforcement on that. Um, but don't forget that responding to COVID-19 is also making sure, uh, as Steve said, uh, getting people to their jobs, essential workers to their jobs. Um, so I think, you know, that that is the lens at which we have to look at this issue. It's not just, you know, how do we create the conditions within uh, rail to make sure that people feel safe, uh, that people are adhering to masks, but also, you know, are, are we providing enough service that people don't feel like, uh, they're they're claustrophobic in the service that exists right now. Um, so I think you know th those are the lenses that we have to look at this issue through. Uh, but we also have to view this as an opportunity, right? If if we are uh, seeing some decrease in uh, ridership right now, then now is the time to invest in capital uh, projects. Uh, and what we've seen from the T is that uh, they have stopped uh, any uh, projects that are not quote shovel ready, uh, and that's a big concern for me because. Uh, while the uh, MBTA board decided to go with an ambitious regional rail plan that would electrify the entire line by 2035, if we're halting all of the design and, uh, and, and construction processes that aren't, quote, shovel ready uh, right now, uh, then that's going to push that out even further to 2035. And I can tell you that my constituents uh, don't want to wait uh, until 2035 to have a reliable service and an electrified line. Well, tell me, uh, Andy, what about the service cuts being proposed and implemented in your district? Yeah, so the weekend cuts are, are really hurting us. And I think one of the things that are surprised that is most surprising to me is that um, the weekend service, the weekend ridership rather, was actually more resilient than um, the weekday ridership. And I think that what that tells us is that the folks taking the, the commuter rail on the weekend actually really needed it uh, much more uh, than even the folks that were taking it during the week. Um, the weekend ridership was holding steady around 30 to 50 percent, while uh, weekday ridership was around 8 percent. And so it, it just wow. doesn't make any sense to be cutting uh, that kind of service when we see that level of resilience uh, during the weekend. And we should mention the Haverhill line is one of seven 
that we'll have no weekend uh, commuter rail service beginning tomorrow. Five lines will, the, according to the MBTA, the ones that have the most ridership. But what you said, Andy, is very revealing. Will, what about in Brockton? What, what about the proposed cuts? What effect will they have there? Um, I mean, yeah. So when I think about like the, the effect of, of all of all of this, it's, you know, when you when you are starting to limit people's ability to get around, right, again, you are, are limiting their ability to be able to be economically uh, you know, viable, economically thrive in, uh, in, in their particular context. Um, and so, you know, I think that the cuts in in some form or fashion, as I was as I was saying earlier, is going to like impact people uh, more economically, um, and 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 their way and their ability to be able to make money. Um, again, the other pieces that I you know that I just find find interesting is that, you know, there is something you were speaking about, um, you know, just COVID and its effects on on all of on all of this and. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, Brockton hovered at for a long period of time at being either second or first in COVID cases um, in the state um, and just hovered there for long periods of time. And, and when you look at the fact that many of these folks who are um, uh, who are living in the city are, again, they're people who are like transit workers. They are people who are trying to get out of the city and get to their jobs and are riding these uh, uh um, riding on the system, I do think that there is something that we need to look at around, are we doing all that we can to keep people safe? And will that increase uh, people's trust um, in the transit system um, at this moment in time? Um, if I see everybody getting sick, um, I'm, on the, <laughs> I'm on the train, I come home uh, and my whole, my whole city is sick and we're all on the same trains together, something might be up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, it seems like there is some kind of question around not only raising people's trust in the system, but actually doing the things that are necessary to make sure people aren't getting sick um, as well um, and putting themselves at risk. And Steve, how much of a problem is this nationally, people reluctant to ride any kind of public transit? Um, I mean, I think it's really understandable that there's a lot of fear and reluctance um, as you know, as uh, I think you mentioned, there, there actually is not, uh, there's not a lot of evidence that transit is spreading the virus. And there's a pretty, there's a very strong consensus that mask wearing uh, can contain it. Um, it was pretty alarming to see the folks in the poll actually reference staff not wearing masks. I mean, it really has to start with public agencies setting the example. And in terms of, um, you know, mass compliance, I think it's really important that we not go immediately to a policing model. We have to be coming up with more, um, you know, with ways that provide people with the resources they have. You know, staff need to have masks available to give to riders. In uh, other city, in New York, for example, um, and in some other cities, uh, Cities have used violence interrupters, folks who traditionally were doing uh, anti-gang work for COVID uh, education and passing out masks. And that's a model that could work really well on transit. Uh, you know, there, there are other examples of, of a non-police safety staff doing this kind of work. So creating a culture of mask wearing is really, really important. Um, I think just to, I just want to respond to, um, I think what both uh, Andy and, and, and Will mentioned, you know, that service cuts like these are going to cause immediate harm, but they also cause a lot of long-term harm too. You know, they, they, yeah. they, you know, they're going to urge people to make that choice to go ahead and buy a car as transit becomes less and less reliable, even though we know that, you know, for many, for many low-income households, what you see in the data is families go in and out of car ownership because you know, they can barely afford it. And then you're just one emergency away from losing the car. So it becomes, when transit gets less unreliable, it becomes a logical choice, but also a really economically uh, devastating one for a lot of families. Good point. Thank you, Steve. Uh, do we have the results of our second poll? How comfortable have you felt riding transit trains or buses during the start of the pandemic? Well, 18% said very comfortable, 
30% somewhat comfortable, 30% not very comfortable, and 23% not comfortable at all. So we have 53% uh, majority uh, not feeling comfortable riding public transit. I want to remind you, uh, those of you participating uh, online, we invite you to ask whatever questions you have. Please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to some of those questions uh, a bit, bit later. Um, as we look at, you know, bringing people back, um, and we've talked about the inequities that have been revealed by the pandemic in the transportation services that we have had, what changes would you like to see um, beside restoring service? Are there any other changes that you think should be made? Uh, Andy, we can start with you. Sure, I think you know one of the things that we should look at in order to actually get a good idea as to what uh, ridership could be um, is lowering fares and doing some some type of pilot that would allow us to actually get a good sense of okay how many people would actually ride rail for example if it was affordable um, can we lower the price to two dollars for you know three months uh, to see how many people actually come back so that we actually get some data on that. Um, we don't really have a, a lot of good information on what people would what people's reactions would be uh, to that, but we've got to try. Um, and I think we, we're not going to find out uh, by keeping the round trip price from Haverhill to Boston at $24 round trip. Um, despite that being the cost, commuter rail before the pandemic was seeing increased ridership. So imagine if it was affordable. Imagine if people could actually take it. Um, I think we would see a, a huge increase in, 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 in rail. Um, and then secondly, uh, just to the point I made earlier, um, we need to invest in uh, the regional rail plan. Uh, you know, the, the uh, MBTA committed to co uh, creating a regional rail office. I believe they have two staffers that are there right now, but uh, there's, my understanding is that there's not much going on. Um, and in this time, uh, this is really the time for us to do all the research and design necessary to further accelerate electrification of the lines. Uh, and there's a lot that we could do to create cascading effects across different lines uh, where we could, for example, you know, run EMUs on the Providence line, which would require less crews that would free up those crews for other lines and we could run more service on other lines. So there are a lot of things that we can do, but the, the, the overarching message is that we have to be creative uh, and we have to be willing to pilot new things like uh, fare de uh, decreases. Mm. Um, so are you, are you disappointed in the governor's veto? of the you know provision that would have allowed a low income fare experiment or program yeah i am absolutely i mean look we're, we're losing the revenue anyways why why not you know uh test this out and see what we can learn from this um and the other point around revenue is like we, we don't ask you know did we generate enough toll revenue to take care of our highways no we just take care of our highways right it's seen as as essential right and so why do we ask you know did we generate enough revenue to electrify the rail line we don't we shouldn't be asking that question the question should be do we have a rail system that can actually provide economic freedom uh housing security and access to uh, a decent life for people uh, those are the questions we should be asking and we don't ask those questions of highway so we shouldn't ask it of rail well in brockton they've instituted a a new fare system so people won't have to pay the exorbitant price of commuter rail to get into the city they pay the price of a bus ticket now right and that's the kind of thing you want to see more of, I assume. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, <laughs> well, I think it's always important to to lower prices uh, uh, for fares and like to make make things affordable for people. But one of the things that I want to lift up that I think is I think is more important is starting to create mutual agreements between cities, right? So, like right now, what ends up happening with Brockton is Brockton is like you know a pillow city. People are like sleeping in Brockton, but they're like trend, they're like leaving Brockton and spending most of their money, most of their time and most of their energy in another place. Um, and so there is no like kind of like a, a symbiotic relationship. It's like uh, where, where, you know, like these other cities are like, if what would it look like for us to communally think about how to build up all of our cities so that they're all thriving and so that everybody wants to travel and, um, and, and bus and, and uh, take trains to and fro you know when that when those kinds of things happen like money happens and people's ability to be able to to uh to thrive in their communities economically happens when you do those kinds of things then fair matters less right and so 
you know, it's not just about us thinking about like, how do we lower fares to make it affordable for folks? Although I think that's very important in the immediate. It is about, do we have a real plan around what it looks like to, um, to help the people of each community economically thrive in the ways um, that make it possible for them to ride transit to begin with? Tracy, you, you had some poll results about people regarding lower fare and free fare options. Uh, yes, uh, but I wanted to actually kind of piggyback on what Will was saying uh, just about, you know, how we actually think about our gateway cities, you know, what he, the term he used, pillow cities or bedroom communities, we keep hearing that over and over again. And as we're talking about transit oriented development, everyone keeps talking about let's build more housing in our gateway cities. And of course, we have a housing crisis and we need a lot more housing. We need to really ramp up our housing production here in the state. Uh, but we also need to be thinking about the things that support housing. How do we actually activate our gateway cities so that we're not just meeting the economic needs of the people who live there, but we're also meeting the social needs of the people who, who live there, that they have places where they can go to actually live full lives, that they can go and actually have places to connect. That's a major equity issue if we're only looking at our gateway cities as places for putting in housing so that we can get people onto the buses, onto the trains to get them into downtown Boston. We need to really kind of correct that thinking to make sure that we're making uh, our gateway cities cities and not trying to turn them into suburbs. Uh, on the fare issue, Steve, uh, nationwide, are people, uh, is there a movement toward lowering fares generally and actually making public transit free? Um, I would say that it's a, it's a discussion that's growing. Um, we've really only seen it fare-free transit happen in uh, small cities, and those are really the places where it's going to be the most financially viable. I think that a trend that is maybe more relevant for this region is the kind of regional rail transformation that uh, Representative Vargas was talking about. In Chicago, for example, in the midst of the pandemic, they are uh, having the fare on two of the commuter rail lines that run through uh, the south side of Chicago and some of the low income uh, southern suburbs. And they're committed to doing that for three years and measuring the results. That was in the works before the pandemic, but it's the kind of service change that really makes a lot of sense based on, um, you know, based on what the needs are. Um, there's a saying in transportation that you can't look at the number of people who are swimming across a river to understand the demand that exists for a bridge across that river. <laughs> and commuter rail is the same. You know, the fares are so exclusionary that they practically are a moat for a lot of people who otherwise would use that service. Um, and I'll just also say that generally that's the direction that we should be looking at uh, when we think about how do we reimagine transit in response to the pandemic. We have to be moving towards all day, all week, service so that we're not so focused on the commute everywhere. We're helping people meet uh, all of their needs. We do have a couple of audits. Tracy, yeah. did you want to yeah. go ahead? Yeah, I just wanted to hop in and just kind of also point out that as we are preparing with the new presidential administration to do this rapid uh, deployment of vaccinations, how are people going to get to the vaccination sites to get their vaccinations? That is something we need to be thinking about. If we're cutting service, and we know that in our gateway cities, 17% of people don't have access to a car, whether it be their own or a friend's car, or have the money to be able to rent a car, how are we gonna get people out there and get them vaccinated? I mean, there are a lot uh, broader questions as to the reason why we should be not only preserving, but ramping up transit service at this time. So I'm gonna then gonna turn it back over to you, Bob, to ask some questions from that. We do have a couple of questions uh, from our audience members and two of them from Sandra and Lisa are somewhat related. Um, Sandra is frustrated to hear about the weekend service uh, on commuter rail being cut even though there's more resilient ridership. And Lisa says, does this show a bias or Sandra says, does this show a bias toward nine to five job commuters? And Lisa says, is there also a bias in terms of considering people who won't be going to work but we'll be working from home. So those are a couple of questions of what might be driving these policy decisions. Any one of you care to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's exactly right. <laughs> I think that uh, oftentimes the people that make the decisions around these things are people that don't have to get on get on the bus or don't have to get on uh, get on transit. And 
that a lot of these decisions get made in a way that community doesn't even know about it. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I could walk down the street and ask, you know, eight out of 10 people, you know, uh, you know, whether or not they would need transit or if they even know how to like get involved in the conversation around transit in their community. And they'd say, no, they wouldn't know uh, what that even looks like. I mean, do they even know who uh, represents them um, in their, uh, on their transit committees? No, uh, for the most part. Are they invited to any of these conversations? No, absolutely not. Um, and so it's like the people then that make the decisions oftentimes aren't the people that are gonna have to suffer or experiencing anything from this. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that the, the bias that we're not talking about um, that I'm gonna continue to keep bringing the bill around is racism, right? Like that racism is a huge part of uh, why these things end up happening the way that they are. And whether it's intentional or unintentional racism um, really doesn't matter because it impacts uh, the impact that, that um, and the ways in which it hits people in communities like Brockton, who are communities that are my, my uh, majority people of color, right, um, uh, city. Uh, they are going to feel the um, the true impacts of these cuts, and not only they're going to feel the true impacts of it, they didn't even have a a say in what it was going to look like, and that's a problem, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have one last uh, poll question we'd like to get up here now because it is relevant to what we're talking about. What if anything keeps you from riding transit more often? Uh, during the pandemic, you see the options there. Take your time and, and let us know what you think. Okay, moving on, we do have another question from somebody who's talking about <clears throat> the need to kind of rebuild regional transit authorities and how they can serve gateway cities and your communities. Um, how do we start from the bottom up, asked Jonathan, and first begin by strengthening and expanding our local bus systems. What about that on the regional transit authorities? Uh, I see. Uh, Andy, you might have some input into what's happening with that, and then we'll go to Steve. Yeah, thanks. Great, great question. I think this links perfectly to what Will and, and Tracy were talking about in terms of creating resilient communities among gateway cities and the regions that they're in, as opposed to solely viewing them as areas where people, you know, come to sleep and then they go to work in Boston. Um, if we want to create uh, resilient communities that uh, have strong local economies, then we need to make sure that people can move around our communities. And that's where the RTAs come in. And so we were really excited that um, we were able to increase funding for the RTAs in, in the last budget that we did, but we've got a far way to go. Um, we have to make sure that uh, these buses are not only affordable, but that the service and schedule uh, align with uh, the economic, medical, and social needs of the folks in our communities. Yeah. Okay. I also want to add that it's also important that the uh, RTAs uh, work together. And I want to also kind of throw the MBTA into that mix because the MBTA is essentially an RTA. And so they should all be coordinating so that whenever the train stops in Haverhill, a bus is there waiting, ready to pick up people to take them around the local community. <clears throat> or if someone is trying to get from Brockton on the bus to a neighboring community, that the neighboring RTA system is there's a, a transfer point or maybe there's some mutual operating agreements that allow for uh, buses, allow for paratransit to actually go beyond their stated borders and boundaries and their service areas. Uh, that is a huge, huge issue of trying to get across the state. I remember there was an article of someone who's trying to get from North Adams out to, I think it was to the Cape. And it was, in, was it? it was ridiculous of how long it took. Yeah, you know, how many buses it took. Yeah, yeah. Buses. yeah, yeah. And so I think that that is something, you know, to kind of think of our statewide transportation and, and geographically, Massachusetts has a very small footprint. There should be no reason why it should take you more than 90 hours mm -hmm. from one side of the state to the other when it only takes about three to drive it. Yeah. No, that's and that's all part of the rebuilding after the pandemic, you know, how we take another look at the transit system we're providing. Uh, Charlotte did ask this question originally, and I want to get it in. And Rich Parr, I know, is in the audience. So it, was there a distinction between which lines people were riding and determining whether they felt comfortable? I don't know if Richard or, or Tracy, you have an answer for that. You know, okay. as, as we saw in the poll data, you know, if, if the more people kind of ride transit, the more comfortable they feel. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of that comfort is around kind of COVID safety, but also people just, I remember someone uh, 
relating to me the story about feeling just very intimidated by getting on the bus because they didn't know like like how much money am I gonna need? How much does it cost? You know, like where you know how do I know when to get off? I know every time I go to a new city and you know I'm trying to figure out how to get from point A to B, I get all anxious about kind of where's the stop? You know, but I'm the one who's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna get off and I'm gonna just walk. You know, however far I need to go. But a lot of people um, are just uncomfortable in unfamiliar situations, and we don't do enough, I think, to kind of make transit just a part of our everyday lives so that people feel very comfortable hopping on the bus when they need to and, and thinking of, the, of transit as a, as a very viable option. Those of us who, I mean, I live in Boston without a car and it's very convenient for me because I have everything that I need within walking distance. But if not, I know how to get on the transit. Uh, but I think that part of it, you know, getting people to feel comfortable again and also uh, to feel comfortable with others on transit will be uh, just riding it more. We have the results of poll three. That would be interesting to see um, what's keeping people from riding transit. Well, uh, the majority is the COVID-19 concern, uh, somewhat related crowding on buses and trains, 17%. 13% just don't feel safe riding transit. 6% uh, don't feel safe getting to and from stops or stations. 32%, not reliable or frequent enough. And certainly the service reductions that'll be taking place won't help that. Too expensive, 11%. Doesn't go where I need to go, 19%. Conductivity, an issue there. And 23% uh, has some other reason keeping people from riding. Um, in terms of, of uh, rebuilding uh, transit, uh, Andy, and, and I know that there also was legislation, I think it was passed in the Economic Development Bill to try to provide more housing around uh, transit sites and gateway cities. Why don't you tell us about that effort? Sure, thanks, Bob. And just a quick follow-up to that poll on the reliability uh, answers that we got there. Um, when I first joined the legislature in 2017, I really tried for the first couple of months to only rely on the commuter rail to get to the state house, which is convenient <laughs> because it goes from Haverhill to North Station and I could walk right up and get to the state house, you would think. But the problem is, is that sometimes I needed to get back to the district for a meeting in the middle of the day, or I needed to leave the state house later at night because uh, we were in session later and the schedule just wasn't frequent or reliable enough for me to be able to rely on that. So I have an EV vehicle now, and that is my primary mode of transportation to get to the state house because I can't take a chance on not knowing if the schedule is going to line up with a emergency for me to get back to the district or a meeting that I need to get back to Haverhill. And so the reliability, I think, is one of the top things that we have to address and the frequency of service. Um, to the point around housing, I'm, I'm very excited about this and, and um, hopeful that this gets uh, implemented in an expeditious way. Uh, in the economic development bill, uh, there was language that um, Kevin Honan, uh, Representative Honan from Boston and I had filed in a separate housing bill uh, that would require communities that have an MBTA stop uh, to have a multifamily zone uh, around that MBTA stop to allow for multifamily housing. Uh, and the purpose of that is to make sure that we're building multifamily housing everywhere across the state, that it's not just concentrated in gateway cities, but that communities that benefit from an MBTA stop are actually building transit-oriented development and providing access to the transportation stop that they benefit from from the state. And what we know is that there are at least 38 uh, municipalities that have an MBTA stop but don't have a multifamily uh, zone around that MBTA stop. Uh, and so what I'm looking for moving forward is making sure that we actually implement that. Uh, since we were so excited that the governor signed it. Um, and we wanna make sure that these communities now create multifamily housing zones uh, that will produce more housing and ensure that we uh, distribute that housing demand and that housing supply equitably across the state. Because I know that's one of the things that we're seeing in gateway cities right now is that while the rent may be going down in parts of Boston uh, because folks are you know, leaving the city, the rent is going up in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, it's still increasing. Uh, and that's because folks are moving out here, right? And so how do we uh, distribute that demand and distribute that, that supply more equitably across the state so that it doesn't contribute to gentrification uh, and ensures that our residents um, still have a place that they can thrive economically? I know, Will, this is a big concern of yours in Brockton. Yeah, I mean, uh, gentrification is, uh, it's a, I think it's a big concern in, uh, in most uh, urban cities that uh, have economic issues. Um, 
uh, for some reason, people see those as viable places to, to invest with that, uh, but like irresponsibly invest. Um, and so they invest in a community and then they continue to keep that community uh, displaced. Um, so, I mean, that's exactly, you know, uh, I mean, the only thing that I would add to to uh, what uh, Representative uh, Vargas was saying is just, just that, you know, what what we're seeing is is uh, is that people are being pushed out of Boston into these cities. It's not that they're like choosing to leave because they want a, a change of scenery. They can no longer they can no longer afford where they were living, um, and that that is because we aren't very responsible with the ways in which we want to build. Um, economic uh, viability in a particular city um, that that doesn't necessarily spread across the board to all of the people, um, but it has other things that are that are in mind. And so, I mean, I think that in relationship to this conversation, if we aren't looking at that and we aren't looking at some of the the ideas that uh, uh, that Andy is offering up, but also um, even even more deeper thinking around uh, what does it mean to be in community with one another as a state? What does it mean to be, uh, what does it mean to care about each other uh, because we are our fellow, uh, uh, you know, uh, residents of Massachusetts? Uh, what does it mean for us to, to, to care because these people um, who are getting on these trains to uh, get to these particular jobs are literally feeding us. Putting food in our mouths are literally the people who are making sure that we stay healthy or when we go into the hospital are taking care of us. Um, if, if we're really serious about like thanking our, 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 our frontline workers, uh, one of the things that we need to start thinking about is how do we like put our investments into the places that they're coming from. Um, and so, the, and that that has to have a really clear lens around making sure that people don't get displaced in the process. And the way you do that is by thinking about them first. No, here in Massachusetts, unfortunately, we don't have uh, much legal protection for people financially in terms of rent control or anything that would help them stay where they're at. Steve, this has got to be a phenomenon nationwide and out migration from the cities, especially during the pandemic. And how is it being dealt with in other areas? You know, I wish <laughs> I, I wish I could say that I've seen like really great examples of cities <laughs> handling this, but but I think it is it is a it is a challenge that that certainly faces us. You know, working in transit in, in all of the cities where we have the strongest transit systems, we also have the most dire gentrification and displacement issues, and I think that that. Um, really speaks to the need to not have transportation and housing conversations be these separate things. You know, we, we work so often in these uh, policy silos and we don't, I mean, I think that there's an ex a lot of exceptions of the folks on the panel here, but people will talk about transit-oriented development without talking about anti-displacement policy or making it harder to evict residents, those have to be part of the same conversations, because otherwise, it just creates the question of who are you building transit for. And if you're building transit to make transportation more affordable for people, but then the most loyal transit riders get displaced out into places where, you know, good transit doesn't exist, it's really not working for them, it's not working for our cities. So I think it's really a um, it's really a challenge that the planning profession is is facing across the country. I don't know that I've seen you know the answer yet. Um, I will say that there are transit agencies, you know, a lot of them looking at their own land as sites for affordable housing, and you know that's probably going to be a relatively small part of the answer, but it is something that transportation agencies can directly do. That's an interesting topic because the MBTA does in fact own quite a bit of land around its facilities. And I don't think that's a topic that's been broached yet, but uh, in terms of uh, the economic development as people are moving out or being, being displaced to these gateway cities, they need more services because there are more of them traveling. I found that out when I spent some time in Brockton. Um, so what is the uh, state doing in terms of preparing for the future. People know what the future might bring and uh, what is being thought of in terms of how are we going to get the connectivity? I know 
for commuter rail, which is really kind of at the bottom of the totem pole here in terms of return of passengership, at least in terms of the MBTA's eyes, uh, they're looking at a schedule that is not centered around morning or afternoon rush hour peaks that is more distributed during the day. Wouldn't it be great if we could have you know, a train every hour on the hour or half hour or whatever, where we don't have to look up a schedule or find out there's a two or three hour gap in the middle of the day. Is this where we, we should go as we bring service back? And will that be what we need to kind of ensure economic development? Andy, do you wanna jump in on that? I would say yes, uh, all, all the above. Um, we absolutely need to have more frequency and service uh, we need to pilot uh, lower fares. Uh, these are all things that need to be on the table as we uh, approach a, a recovery. Um, I, I think we need to make sure that we're not thinking about the commuter rail as a nine to five anymore, right? Uh, that it's not just, you know, folks who are going in with briefcases and coming back home and, uh, and, and just sleeping uh, at home. That this is a fluid system where people who have different types of jobs uh, particularly as we've seen on the weekend service, the, the fact that uh, that uh, ridership has been uh, more uh, resilient than the weekday service, I think is the perfect indicator that we're not dealing with the economy of the 1960s or 50s or 70s anymore. Uh, that this is, a much, this is a very different economy and we have to be open to uh, adapting to that. And I also wanna jump in and say that even before the pandemic, a lot of our employers in gateway cities were having a hard time getting workers a lot of times because transit was not available. I've spoken to uh, entrepreneurs who said they've had 50 open positions because they can't get the workers to the jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, this again makes the case for regional rail. We need to be thinking much differently about our commuter rail system and then also making sure that the bus systems through our regional transit authorities are all working together to make sure people are getting where they need to go. Andy, without the commuter... Without commuter rail on weekend, what what options do people have? Is there a bus? Uh, there is the local regional, you know, RTA here, the MBRTA, but uh, the options to get into Boston and in between uh, cities that are in between Haverhill and Boston are very limited. Uh, we're talking about ride sharing. Um, and so what, what these gaps uh, create is short-term solutions uh, that uh, don't solve the long-term problem. Um, for example, here in Haverhill, we were able to uh, create a $50,000 program to help people uh, get to medical appointments, get to their jobs. But again, we're using cars for that. We're using taxis. We're using ride sharing companies to make that happen. Uh, and this is, uh, Haverhill, I think, is the second or third community to actually have one of these uh, pooled ride sharing uh, programs. And those are really popping up as a response to a failed public transit system. Um, and they're, yes, they're great short term stopgap solutions, but we really have to get at that systemic problem. Uh, that, that's happening in our public transit system. And lastly, I'll just add that, you know, a lot of the conversation right now is focused around, you know, let's wait and see what the federal government does. And, and I certainly hope uh, that there's uh, transportation funding coming from Washington, um, but I'm also not going to uh, put my faith in, in, in Washington saving us. Uh, we, we have to act here in Massachusetts. We know that uh, we can generate more revenue for transportation through some of the uh, mechanisms that have already been uh, proposed and passed in the House. Uh, last session, uh, we were really excited to pass that transportation package that would have generated somewhere around 500 to $600 million in additional annual revenue a year. Um, and so there are things that we need to do right here. Uh, yes, let's hope for the best uh, for Washington to come in with some major funding, but we also have to take up our responsibility here to ensure that we raise the revenue necessary to create a system that we're proud of. And Steve, what about the federal government saving us all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, it'll, it'll make a real difference, right? I mean, you know, the, our new president has called for $20 billion in additional transit aid. That would put transit agencies in a real strong position as, as the region reopens. But, you know, I think what Representative Vargas said is, is correct also, that there's a lot that the state can do, that cities can do to, you know, to borrow a phrase, to build transit back better. And we can't just, you know, hang around and wait to increase service when we see ridership go back up, you have to get out in front of it. Service drives demand and employers are gonna make their decisions about reopening based on the transportation system that exists. So you've gotta do so much of what we've talked about 
today. You know, we, we're going to need more emergency bus lanes. We need more bus shelters. We need a, a bus system that that works for more of the day and all week. And we have to reimagine the rail system. We have to do all of that. So we're not going back to the old normal, which wasn't working for everyone, which was an inequitable transit system. We need a better normal. And Will, any final words from you? Yeah, I just want to continue to keep ringing the bell of like, as we start to make these decisions, like that we want to start to think about them communally, um, that, that like the people actually deserve to be a part of this conversation. And that, that a lot of these conversations um, uh, that, that happen as, as it relates to people's lives and people's ability to be able to thrive in their communities um, happen without them. And so when you start to make these decisions without, without the folks that could really, that actually really could reimagine this in a way that's not only viable, but that is like beneficial for all people. Um, well, yeah, when you leave them out of the conversation, then we will always fall short. Um, and so yeah. I just want to continue to invite that. It seems to be a constant theme that we've heard in each of these uh, programs. Tracy, any final words from you? You know, I have many final words, but, I, but you know, I'll just share a phrase that you know, I've said before and I'll say again, you can't starve your way out of a famine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tracy Corley from Mass Inc., uh, Will uh, Dickerson from the city of Brockton, Andy Vargas, state representative from Haverhill, and Stephen Higashide from, uh, well, wherever you are virtually this morning, Stephen, it's been wonderful to have you here. We want to thank uh, our producers, Annie Scheffler and Lauren Joel and Candro for producing another one of these great foreign programs, and we hope that you have all enjoyed it. Uh, keep in mind that uh, we will be, uh, we have recorded this and we'll be making it available on our website. And we certainly invite you to the next forum that we're having as part of our Todd Talks on Transit Oriented Development in Gateway Cities. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm.